I would like to thank for this invitation to such prestigious conference. Well, I'll start with this very well-known dictum of Cantor. And uh, mathematics can freely introduce new notions. Of course, they may be abandoned. Cantor, oh, it's well known to philosophers, opposed the Kronecker, and this was perhaps in this context that it should be understood. Some years earlier, Dedekind stated that by forming a theory, in his case, a cut of an irrational number, we create a new number. This was an example of a constructed notion, a free creation of the human mind. Now, Jan Łukasiewicz, a celebrated Polish philosopher, the one who invented Polish notation, uh, distinguished between constructive notions from, distinguished from reconstructive, empirical. He referred with some reservation of, to Dedekind's statement, and, but what he mentioned that the consequence of the creation is spontaneous emergence of countless relations which no more depend on our will. That is, we can create freely, but then no, we are no longer so much uh, free. It's limited by logical constraints. This is a passage from a Polish book by Professor Heller, the important big sense of mathematics due to logical consequence. If I accept one, I must accept another. And why must I? Who forces? Nobody. But yet I must. And generally, we bear badly any restrictions of our liberty. But in the case of mathematical induction, this inability of the conclusion gives us feeling of safety. I have not deviated. This is a bit religious, isn't it? Uh, and of the accompanying intellectual comfort, sometimes joy. Uh, and it's mathematicians know such invisible wall. I found it many, many times. I tried such a big wall going through the whole theory. And uh, oh, a well, new concept must be consistent, no contradiction, uh, and practically only intersubjective mental structures are accepted. But the main purpose of my talk here is to look for restraints and patterns in the historical development of mathematics. Some paths will be distinguished. And I will compare with the case of category theory. Atiyah uh, expressed his view that it's very hard to put oneself back in the position of what was likely to be a mathematician, because so much was of mathematics was absorbed by our culture that we, we cannot imagine how Poincaré or Hilbert or somebody really thought. We only know what has, has been written. Tak. Uh, it's, but now it's not 100, but only 75 years after the publication of the paper by Eilenberg and MacLean. But the development accelerated. He, I believe that it's hard to imagine how Mathematicians thought in 1945. Uh, we reconstruct the ideas, but reconstructs are always specifically biased by our present understand of mathematics. Well, I present this includes a very wide spectrum, perhaps too wide for this 40 minutes, uh, from ancient Greek and from children counting to 
category theory. Main ideas, mathematics concept is never independent of previous knowledge. It requires some period of incubation, lengthy one. There's a long distance between spontaneous unconscious use of a mathematical idea and conscious systematic use of it. And moreover, what is very important, a person who has achieved a higher level of mathematical thinking is often unable to imagine thinking of people either from another epoch or of a learner, a student. Transgression. Briefly, I mathematical cognitive transgression, this crossing either by individual or by scientific community of previously non traversable limit of mathematical knowledge. There were many transgressions, some great ones, some mini transgressions. Usually they were not single acts but involve global change of thinking, which usually matured for years or generations. And uh, some important, from practical dealing with specific geometric shapes to deductive geometry. Acceptance of negative numbers, it took centuries. Passage from potential infinity to actual infinity. Emergence of projective geometry discovery of non-Euclidean geometry in, in my opinion, creating the theory of elementary toposis. As an example of transition, it's well known, discovery that the diagonal of a square is not commensurable with its side. In modern setting, it means irrationality of the square root of 2, but it was foreign to Greeks. They didn't, couldn't think this way. Uh, well, from a remark of Aristoteles, it was that it was proved by contradiction. First such a proof in history, but in fact, nothing certain is known about it. The, all this information attributing it to Pythagoreans has been found in the te text written 800 days later. In spite of popular beliefs, in my opinion, this uh, opinion was not a single discovery by any individual. I believe that it must have been a lengthy process. That never in the historical development such a major, major change occurred in short time. Pythagorean understanding of mathematics was eroded by this. The paradigm was undermined. And my approximate reconstruction is they were deeply involved in thinking of odd and even numbers. And they were proficient in visualizing, analyzing their properties. And as they thought of the common unit to measure both the side of the square and its diagonal, they arrived at something major a number which would be both even and odd. This was an aporia, troubled them, hurt their feelings. And I believe they tried to clear this, but the investigation didn't help. They faced unacceptable conclusions and gradually, but it, took, it took, could take many years, overcame the previous approach and because it was based from true to true. The new idea of a proof by contradiction germinated in their minds. And finally, they reconciled themselves to regarding the site as a logos, without a ratio, irrational. Now, next thing, phylogeny and ontogeny. The first refers to evolutionary history of mathematics, or as I always claim, it's not history, it's modern reconstructions. And ontogeny means development of basic mathematical concepts, structures in the mind of individual 
child from birth. And there are two complementary descriptions. And this, such a phrase, ontogeny recuperates phylogeny. It implies, it's a question whether it's true, that one can learn from the history of old matter for the sake of teaching young people. This sometimes gives useful hints. Since, for instance, we know that the historical process of forming the general concept of a function took centuries, roughly from Descartes to Peano, if not from ancient times. We should not expect that a secondary school student can grasp it after a few lessons. However, thinking this way may be misleading. Jean Piaget, who was in favor of the parallelism, reasoned roughly as follows. Since one-to-one -one correspondence preceded numerical verbal counting in the early periods of human civilization, the same should apply to children. And moreover, he knew Cantor theory of cardinal numbers and Bourbaki's approach. And he insisted on a one-to-one -one correspondence as the foundations of early school arithmetic. He neglected children's counting. But he didn't take into account that children are taught numbers at a very age later. And uh, the counting is deep, deeply rooted. So this parallelism adversely affected the early arithmetics in new math movement. Piaget always stressed the arithmetic cognition that it results from logical mathematical experience with concrete objects, with pebbles, say. This adduced from the child's actions is abstracted from coordination of intentional motions and thoughts. Hans Freudenthal, uh, in the concept of mathematics, suggested the converse idea. Perhaps he was the first one to suggest this. What can we learn from educating the present youth for understanding the past? It's reversed the direction. And now I will outline some ideas about successors in developments of mathematics. Uh, some mathematical concepts were natural. The way word natural is vague actual successor to previous ones, and other concepts which could be conceived and defined only after opening new path of thoughts. And some metaphorical labels, onward development, branching off, merging, upward development, downward development. I will briefly explain what I mean. With examples, I cannot give a definition, no clear criteria, but even discussion may be worthwhile. Example, emergence of numbers. Well, this was well known, this one, two, many. Uh, what is not so much known, let's uh, conjecture that the word three is related to trans. And there are s s some evidence in this Proto-Indo-European. Ah, so this was from two to three, was a great jump. It was an ancient, ancient mental obstacles. But it's no longer now, because children are taught numbers <laughs> together with learning the language. So, uh, so is it? But this took centuries. Uh, but what I mean here by all, 
of indefinite counting. At the moment, the child can go beyond 10 and knows that it can go on. Includes what is natural continuation. I believe that addition is natural, that if you go, uh, there are stages. One is count all. The child has to count all items. Let's say three and uh, five, they have to count one up to eight. And then more advanced, count on. May start with the first number and continue. Subtraction, multiplication, division. There are two kinds of division, equal sharing and equal grouping. And even I include simple powers as still within the same development. Uh, well, what are the features? No branching. It goes on. Ontological stability. Each single concept essentially remains the same. Also, it's enriched after x extension of the scope. It's a subject to evolutionary changes. Uh, but the most important condition, the relative difficulty of natural is not taken into account. It's a question whether they naturally follow, but not them. So whether it's the same line. Fractions, in my opinion, branch off from natural numbers. Uh, there are many ties between fractions and natural numbers, but still it goes in another very There are two ways of introducing fractions. First, this is, has nothing to do uh, with foundations of mathematics. This is how it goes really in the, in the history and in children's minds. Some idea as a whole is divided into parts and, and, and of them are taken. The second, the whole thing is equally divided into n things divided into m. For instance, three quarters of pizza may be obtained by cutting it into four parts, taking three. So this would be something like this. Or take two, three pizzas divided into four people. This is not the same. Well, this looks quite elementary, but it was significant in the phylogen of fractions. The first is akin to ancient Egyptians, the second to Greeks rations. Arabs both inherited and at certain Middle Ages they combined to put into one single concept of a ratio. And they are still present, but not necessarily noticed. And William Thurston, a field medalist, described his discovery of this. I remember as a child in fifth grade coming to the amazing realization that the answer of this one divided by this is such a fraction. What a tremendous labor-saving device. To me, this meant a certain tedious core, while there are the object with no implicit work. I went excitedly to my father to explain my major discovery. He told me that, of course, this is so. This fraction and A divided by D are just synonyms. For him, this was a small variation in notation. The fact that after so many years, Thurston vividly remembered this fact. This shows that this is really two different concepts of a fraction which are identified and form a single mathematical object. And this is very common practice, change of ontology. Two different beings result, results of two different mental constructions became regarded as a single one. Well, a person trying this uh, doesn't appreciate it. Uh, but uh, crucial weight, I will see later. Well, let's go. Uh, 
Now, onward development and this branching off can be traced in many. I will just to give an idea what I mean by this is calculus starts with the theory of real numbers. And the, the first branching is infinite, the concept of infinite sequence, which is not our algebra. And then limits, next branching, and so on. Now, by upward development, I mean passing from some concept in relation to more abstract version. Examples. Transition from practical addition. For instance, 2 and 3 make 5 to symbolic version. This is transition for a child at age 6 or 7. It took centuries in history. The uh, sign plus appeared for the first time in 15th century. And the equality sign was introduced uh, in 1557. It's exactly known in which publication for the first time this symbol was used. So mathematics, till 16th century, didn't have anything like this. They couldn't write it. They wrote complete sentences in Latin. Well, a lot of them, for instance, from this to axiomatically given vector space, from a vector space over R to over any field, from group theory to the category of groups, from a category to a meta-category, they are going up in abstraction. This is something completely different than forward. Forward means developing at the same level of abstraction. Here is going up. Now what? Well, some sense reverse uh, from to more or this is abstract Boolean algebras and Shannon applied to something concrete, more concrete. Well, in 20th century, the growth of mathematics was rapid and upward development became much easier than earlier. This was a result of both. General change of attitude of mathematicians toward abstraction and the habit of expressing all concepts in the language of set theory. And in set theory, you can go up easily. Branching off and merging were so frequent in 20th century that it, uh, these metaphors are useless because they were too, would be too complicated. But there was an double exception. A new theory, category theory, which opened a new direction. Uh, consequently, the beginnings may be discussed in a way akin to that used with respect to distance past. Okay, so the very feature of category theory is that it has a pretty precise date of official birth. The publication of the paper by Ellen Beck McLean, presented at a meeting of AMS in 42 and published in 53. According to Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, this appeared almost out of nowhere. It's not quite so. Each mathematical theory, and in particular category theory, some ideas were conceived much earlier, particularly in algebraic topology, and some of the ideas can be traced to 19th century. Так. I will give one example of change of thinking. Uh, symbol f of x, it was f is function, which is fixed, and x is a variable. In late 1920s, in function analysis, this viewpoint was reversed. This was something really uh, astonishing. The point was regarded as fixed, while function became a variable. For instance, 
point was in interval 0, 1, a function with the space of continuous functions. And this word, the point became a functional. And this change of role functional became crucial, for instance, in Pontryagin duality of locally compact abelian groups, in Gelfand's theory of commutative Banach algebras, and in many. And for instance, Eilenberg MacLean used it in the first example motivating the concept of natural transformations. To make a simple example, they took finite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, MacLean has written that categories, functors, and natural transformations were discovered by Ellenberg MacLean. Now, uh, I put it in red because it may be regarded as indication of a Platonistic attitude of MacLean. But this is something much more interesting. When I first read this passage, from the same note, I had the feeling that this was a delicate joke. I don't know what is your feeling, and particularly native speakers, uh, probably. He wrote the following. Now, the discovery of ideas as general as G's is chiefly the willingness to make a brush. This word doesn't exist in two thick British dictionaries, but I found it in Webster. In Webster, it was a mass of fragments. In Polish dictionary, Rumowisko. Aha, make a brush or speculative abstraction. In this case, supported by the pleasure of paralleling, and I didn't know this, so I found that this means healing or borrowing without permission. So, well, not stealing, but some word not so frequently used, words from the philosophers. Category from Aristotle and Kant, functor from Carnap, logische syntax der Sprache. Okay, this sentence has been taken very seriously. Now, I owe to Professor Jan Wolenski certain facts. In fact, in Carnap's book, 1929, the term functor doesn't appear. The term functor was used in proportional calculus by Kotarbiski in his book on elements of theory of cognition and logic, formal logic methodology of now. This was perhaps the earliest use of this term functor in Propositional Calculus. Carnap met Tarski in Vienna in February 1930, and then visited Warsaw in November 1930. It's known that he learned much from Tarski. In 1933, in the Polish version of his famous functions, uh, the famous paper on the concept of truth in formal languages, Tarski used the term functor and mentioned that he owed it to Kotarbiński. Carnap used the term functor in his book 1934, in a sense more general than Kotarbiński and Tarski. And another fact, Eilenberg studied mathematics in Warsaw from 1930. So he knew all those people. Uh, it's, it's rather impossible that Eilenberg didn't meet this term functor. If, uh, you should remember that in Warsaw, philosophers and mathematicians work together at Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. This is perhaps the only place in the world when philosophers were admitted to mathematicians. <laughs> Mean for well, this uh, 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 common word for conjunction, conjunction alternative. Connector, logical connector, uh, logical this this uh, symbols the joining symbols. two sentences. Okay. Well, 
I would argue the definition of a category factor are within, still within major onward development of that part of mathematics which was known at that time, set theory, algebra, and so on. For instance, for if somebody worked in group theory, this was a natural continuation to thinking of all groups, thinking of all homomorphies, isomorphies, and the composites as a single whole. This was natural. Similarly, one could speak about vector spaces, linear max S one whole. Axioms of category are missiles of those of semi-group theory. The concept of covariant functor was natural of homomorphism of algebras. Contravariant functors were present duality theories, like Pontiagin's duality of compact abelian groups. So this was nothing really new. And the initial neglect of the paper by Eilenberg by a mathematician was probably the result that it was a long paper within onward development of known parts of mathematics with many definitions, many examples, and no theorem which would require an involved uh, proof. Ralph Kromer, in his book Tool and Object on the History of Philosophy of Category Theory, writes outright that Eilenberg and Maclay needed to have remarkable courage to write and submit for publication the paper, almost completely concerned with conceptual. Eilenberg somehow managed uh, that the paper was sent to a young reviewer. So they were really afraid that it would be rejected from transactions. Well, this is later that it's essentially auxiliary, yes, basic concepts are. This conceptual clarification turned out very highly effective in the book by Eilenberg and Steenroth, and this opened a new way in algebraic topology, completely changed thinking of this. Tuck. What were novelties in that book? Use the same letter to denote by the over correspondence of a functor and its morphist correspondence. This had not been a common practice, even if both were in the same paper. Now, Eilenberg, MacLean, this is a, a, from the paper, uh, what the theory emphasizes. Whenever abstract objects are constructed, it is advisable to regard the construction of the corresponding induced mappings on these new objects as an integral part of the definition. Uh, this entails a simultaneous consideration of objects and mappings. That means not individual objects, but categories. And they explicitly mention that their approach may be regarded as a continuation of Felix Klein Erlanger program. <coughs> Another novelty, which might appear modest, was regarding elements as in a single quasi ordered set as objects of a category, which is no standard way of thinking with this definition. And this opened a way to generalization regarding certain diagrams as small categories. Uh, the content of dual category at its root is various duality theories, particularly in that of projective geometry. And this was um, mentioned in the paper by Lemberg, developed explicitly and nicely by Maclean in 1950. Products of two categories were also analogous to what was known before. Up to this point may be regarded as between onward development of previous mathematical theories. What should be recognized as branching off was the concept of natural equivalence. It was a completely new idea, making essential use of commutative diagrams. By the way, it's not clear why they refrain from setting it immediately in the general form of natural transformation. This would need uh, one line more. Second branching in the history of 
category theory, where definitions formulated the form of unique factorization problems. The first explicit formulation was then was only in the case of free topological groups by Pierre Samuel from Bourbaki-Zubruck. But it was still in language of set theory without any arrows. Uh, McLean wrote the definition of direct and free products of kernels and co-kernels in diagrammati diagrammatic form with unique factorization requirement and stressing the word. So here this was for the first time explicitly written which is now, which is something in the background, everybody understands this as something very simple. But it required MacLean to write it down. Well, it's not clear again for me why he didn't formulate it for a general category and he didn't add certain uh, examples like Banach space theory about which they spoke in 1945. Simply referring to groups. Uh, oh well, of course, very special cases of limits and co had been longer theory in very specific in various theories. It's well known the category theory as a general theory, not as application to topology, but as a general theory, later as a dormant, till the what I would call third branching off, with the emergence of a series of significant mutual tight concepts in the second half of 1950s. The turning point was the paper by Daniel Kahn on adjoint functors and at the same time, independently, several related concepts, representable factors, universal morphs, Yoneda lemma. It's quite interesting that so many different ideas at the same time. Uh, well, this, this is, shows that the theory matured to such a change. Uh, yes. But Many cases of adjunctions were uh, known earlier, for instance, the celebrated loop and suspension uh, in homotopy theory. But it is a common phenomenon. The mathematical idea may be used spontaneously without being conscious of its more general abstract setting. Louvier, in his paper, attacked the general question as to what conditions of uh, um, a category must satisfy in order to be equivalent to the category of sets. Well, he gave in his original paper in 64 a list of elementary conditions and one non-elementary answer, products and coproducts of any indexive family. And for instance, in this uh, set, was a coproduct of uh, those terminal ob copies of terminal object. This achievement may be regarded as being still within onward development after the third branching off, that means after adjoint functors. Uh, I recall the difficulty and originality of a concept are not taken into account. What is crucial whether the concept involved are within the scope of previous knowledge. For instance, the idea of characterizing the most important object in a given theory was not new either. For instance, the cyclic group can be characterized as a group with one free generator. The field of real numbers as a complete ordered field. Closed interval is characterized up to homeomorphism is a compact connected house of space with exactly two non-cut points. On the other hand, Louvier's work on logic, which started in his thesis, opened a new era in category theory. 
categorical, in my opinion, categorical logic, the theory of elementary toposis, which combined ideas Grothendieck, uh, was a transgression in the history of mathematics. So now let me come back to the title of my talk, Freedom and Limitations. Um, the history of con category theory shows that mathematicians were somehow bound by previous conceptual development until somebody, often quite unexpectedly, discovered something new which was hidden before and opened a new way. Thank you. <laughs>